Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tala and I am an SSI Science Communication this intern this summer. This is our 10th and last episode, I cannot even believe it, of our Live with the SSI intern series where we interview members of our SSI cohort. So to provide a little bit of background, SSI stands for Summer Systematics Institute, and this RU or Research Experience for Undergraduates is funded by the National Science Foundation. With the exception of myself and Amy, who our interviews were yesterday, if you want to go rewatch them or any of our other episodes, um, all of our peers are working with a curator or a postdoc here at the California Academy of Sciences. So we have a preset of questions for our interns, but please feel free to leave comments or questions in the chat below, and we'll get to them as the discussion unfolds. Without further ado, we are so excited to introduce our last guest, Delson. So Delson, would you like to share your hometown, your pronouns, home institution, and anything else you want the audience to know? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Delson. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I was born in Minneapolis. I lived there for the first 13 or 14 years of my life. Moved to the Monterey area about nine years ago, and I'm currently at UC Santa Cruz, um, where I'll be starting my fourth year in like a month and a half. Go Sammy the Slug. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so, and I think you're wearing a UC Santa Cruz. like I am, you? yes. Okay, got to represent. Gotta yep. Sammy. Yep. Okay. So our first question is, how would you explain your summer research project to a fifth grader? Yeah, um, so I'm working with this group of fish. They're called siphon fish. Um, and they're found in a whole lot of places sort of throughout the globe. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons to make them interesting, but the one that we're focused on is that they glow. Um, they're these bacteria that live sort of in a special organ uh, on their stomach that produce light. And what we're trying to figure out is whether the different species of siphon fish have different kinds of bacteria and also why that might be and whether or not it's sort of like species specific or if it's habitat specific, we think maybe the species that live in warmer waters might have different bacteria from the species that live in cooler waters. Um, and so there's just kind of a lot of unknown going on in this really unusual fish. Um, and then the other reason of why we're looking at it specifically is that there are actually a lot of fish that glow. Most of them live in the deep ocean it's really, really hard to find those or keep them alive in the lab environment. So we're kind of tentatively hoping that this project can uh, get a foot in the door for a future research down the line. And the glowing of the fish is called bioluminescence, right? Correct. Super cool. Mm -hmm. So do you know how, um, I don't know if you have any like specimens or whatever that have been brought up or because um, I know you said it's really hard to bring them up to the surface, but like, if that is the case, do you know how they do that or like how they go about keeping it alive? Oh, I don't even know if, if it needs to be alive for you to do the work. So that's another question too. Yeah, so the we can keep the bacteria alive without the fish. Basically they live naturally in seawater. They don't need the fish at all. Um, but then the other nice thing about this particular like study system is that siphon fish live in shallow water. They're like the only, not the only, but one of the only bioluminescent fish that can be found, like a coral reef that's like, you know, a foot below the surface of the water. Um, so you can literally just catch them and keep them in like a fish tank. I think we did for quite a while have like live siphon fish, just like in our lab in a little tank. Um, so those ones are actually very easy to keep alive. With deep sea things, I, I, it's a very, I think it's a pretty complicated process and it often doesn't go very well. Um, it's just difficult to keep them at the right pressure is the issue. Yeah, like that, those pictures of like those deep sea puffer fish that like come up and look like all squashed and sad. Yeah, those blobfish. Little, yeah, the blobfish, they, it became a meme. But that's so sad. I wonder, like it probably looks really nice and it's actual it steak. <laughs> it looks completely different. It just looks Aww. like a normal fish. Oh, poor blobfish. <laughs> poor blobfish. Um, so... Tell me, what did you think research was before you started this internship? Or like, I don't know if you've had any other research experience. Yeah, so I have, I've had a little bit. Um, I'm lucky in that regard. I've worked in research labs at Santa Cruz. Um, and so like by the time I got here, I knew, I think I'd already sort of broken the stereotype of like, it's very like serious, un, like, you know, people in, in spotless white lab coats with pipettes and things. Like I'd already knew that there was more to it than that. Um, even still, I think I like underestimated how many different things research is. Um, because as I think we can all kind of attest now, like there is 
there's certainly like, there's, there's plenty of lab work. Um, there's also a lot of computer side stuff. There's field work, like a big component of research is camping for like, you know, depending on what you're studying, just like go be in the woods for like a month or be in Madagascar as one of our um, presenters just was saying, um, or like doing literature review or caring for animals in captivity. Like there's so many different things that go into uh, just research in general. Um, and I think that's cool because you do meet every kind of person. Like in this field, you kind of just meet people from all kinds of different walks of life. And it also means that there's space for so many different people in research. Um, it's a very sort of all-encompassing field. Yeah, I don't Did you even know that you could do research in like an institute like the California Academy of Sciences or like museums or the curators? I personally didn't, but I'm like, because you grew up in the area and like you, you spent some time in Monterey. Yeah, I mean, it's... So the one that I'm like more familiar with in this uh, institution is the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And there it's very separate. Like there's the aquarium and then there's like the research institute, which is like, you know, a 30 minute drive up the road. Like they're just separate things completely. And so it, it did not really occur to me that there was, um, that the museum is just half the institution, the public display part is a component, but then behind the scenes, there's also so much research going on. Definitely, I like didn't know that there was so much more on the back side of the building where all the actual researchers are, Yeah. but it's pretty cool. Um, so like what really got you into deep sea like species? Because I know that that's something you're really passionate about. Yeah, um, it's a, I think it's, it's maybe kind of a long answer, but I grew up uh, on like the, the David Attenborough nature documentaries. I, I feel like a lot of us probably have. Um, and he's, he, he did a couple of them where there was like, we're just gonna go in the deep sea and like see what we can find, like record it. Um, and it was so alien and so weird. Like it's kind of almost necessarily fascinating. It's just completely different from any life you see anywhere else in the world. Um, and then as I kind of got older, I realized that not only is that arguably like the weirdest group of living things in the world, but probably the most abundant, like the deep sea is most of the living space on earth. The biosphere is something like two thirds deep sea or something like that. Um, and still like up until mid 19th century, we didn't think there was any life in it at all. And so we're, we're way behind on figuring out what lives there. Um, and as a result, there's new discoveries happening happening constantly and they're they're very very cool so as soon as i knew that this was like even a thing i was like that that's crazy Tell me in i want to know more i want to be the guy who, who describes the new the new things yeah definitely it's it's super cool and i think like like you you've alluded to like one of the biggest problems with this field of study is like actually getting down there and being able to like yeah. collect that stuff um, because the siphon fish that you're studying isn't in the deep sea like, or at right. least not as deep as like the other stuff that we make that we're interested in finding out about. Yeah. Yeah. You can pretty much catch it with like a net and go to the beach and come back with a handful of them. You don't oh, need like yeah. an expensive submersible or an ROV or anything, which is very nice for, for cyber fish. So for the deep sea research, they use, what do they use to get down there? Um, historically. So we started like the first example of this was called the bathysphere and it was two guys in a giant steel ball and like no no bells and whistles it was just like we're just gonna put a, a giant steel ball down there and see what we can find we've come a pretty far away since then um now for a long time we had submersibles and we're kind of switching more towards things like rovs which is like like an unmanned submersible it's more like a drone um and it's it's still difficult because even the comparatively like cheap and easy solutions are really expensive um, and difficult to, to manage, but I think ROVs right now, remotely operated vehicles is what that stands for. Probably the, the, the dominant technique. It, that probably is safer too for like any scientist that's trying to get down there. Yes. <laughs> like, Quite a bit. With like all the news that we've heard recently about yeah. trying to get down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, so this is kind of like a random question that I'm going to throw in real quick, but what is like a deep sea fun fact that you can tell me? Oh, okay. So, I mean, there's so many. I, I just, I'm gonna have to like comb through all of the ones I wanna say. I think one of them is that we keep finding new, like deepest dwelling fish. 
like every couple of years we're like we found the, the organism that lives like farthest down in the ocean and then like two years later we found oh there's another one that's, that's farther down um, they're usually snailfish for some reason there's this particular family that adapts really really well to like the bottom of the ocean um, and one of my favorite things about them is that they have this is a very new discovery and it's still kind of in like the early stages of figuring out what it all means but they have um genes that protect their dna from the extreme pressure of the deep ocean like there's so much force on them from all the water that they have to like physically hold their dna together more tightly um and we learned that like two years ago or like last year that's crazy yeah oh my gosh. we need yeah. to know what those genes are so that we can just start to <laughs> yeah deep in the water mm -hmm. that's why that that's really cool thank you for sharing of course uh, so kind of segueing a little bit into, or not segueing, but moving into, um, back into research, do you feel like you are a scientist and if, or if, or if you do, or if you don't, like, what does being a scientist mean to you? Yeah. I think this is the one where like everybody kind of takes pause for a second and they're like, oh, I don't know. Um, yes and no, I think is like, I. I would say yes, I would call myself that because just on paper, like I feel like I, the box is technically checked, like I'm being paid to work at a research institution and do work for them. Um, but at the same time, if you ask me if I feel like one, I'm going to say no. <laughs> um, because I don't know if you had this, but like on your 18th birthday, people are like, do you feel like an adult when you start high school? And you're like, do you feel like a high school? And it's like, no, not really. I feel pretty much the same. Like, I kind of feel like a kid who got let in the back door to, like, see all the cool fish in jars. But then, like, I, I guess I'm, I guess I would say so. Um, it's just difficult to say for sure. Like, that's, I, I don't know if I would feel like one, if that makes sense. That's a great analogy because, like, I recently turned 21 and everyone's mm -hmm. like, you feel 21? And I'm like, I feel like I'm 10. Like, what do you Yeah, you <laughs> I feel know? like the same. Yeah, yeah, like every time I get older, I, I feel like more and more like it's still like a child. Um, mm -hmm. But hey, you'll get there. I definitely think that you you can't say you're a scientist. I mean, you spent the whole summer in the CCG lab um, working your butt <laughs> Yeah. No, you're doing great. Lots of pipe betting. <laughs> well, so how does your personal identity like inform your science? Yeah, um, that's another good one where I feel like most of us just have so many things that we could or would like to talk about. So I'll, I'll condense a little bit. Um, I think in one sense, um, in a more sort of superficial way, I was very lucky to grow up where I did. Um, Minnesota commits a lot of energy, I think, into making sure that we have sort of like this well-preserved, accessible, abundant wilderness. Um, so I was able to grow up in a place where I can like go outside after it rains and flip over a log and find like slugs and springtails and millipedes and cool things like that and just look at nature being cool. Um, and similarly, like I could retreat to like my, my grandma's cabin, like a literal log cabin in the North Woods and just be in nature for like a week. Um, and so I was very lucky to have that. And I think it definitely, um, it made sure that I had the ability to like immerse myself in that interest. Um, I think um, <laughs> it happens um, on a slightly like more personal level. Um, I'm also an autistic person and there's a whole really interesting like history with uh, autism and STEM. Um, it's complicated to talk about for a couple of reasons. One being that autism as a term didn't exist until like 70 years ago or so. And so a lot of the people that we um, look up to is kind of like these great revolutionary scientists existed before autism as a concept did, but also were almost certainly like autistic themselves. Um, I made a list of people who we think are, I just, I, I had to write this down because I thought I would forget, but uh, Albert Einstein, Charles Darwin, Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison, Gregor Mendel, Carl Linnaeus, Isaac Newton are all people who are today, we would look at them and say, these people absolutely meet the requirements. Um, to be considered autistic, but just because they existed at that time, they didn't have, that there was, the term was not used for them. So there's like this storied history of um, people with autism doing science. Um, and yet it's also super invisible. Like it's almost never talked about. It kind of, um, 
it's often on the periphery if like it's discussed at all, which is strange because um, autism is just kind of necessarily like it almost hardwires you to have a scientifically minded brain. Like the things that you're good at are things like data organization, like remembering dates and numbers uh, and names for things, and pattern recognition, and like hyper fixating on details and things like that. We're all very useful skills in science. Um, so I think science has also had this history where it attracts more autistic people than most other professions. And then it's also kind of built on the collaboration of autistic and non-autistic people, which I would say makes it perhaps not unique, but um, unusual, I think, as far as career paths go, that it has this history of not just people coexisting, but actively collaborating and building on each other's skill sets. Um, so I would say like, for me, again, as an autistic person, science is really sort of occupies that unique, uh, spot for me where it's like, this is a career path that's almost, um, catered towards things I do. And yet, um, and yet this identity is almost never discussed as being part of it. So that's, I guess that's the spark notes version. <laughs> um, no, that that's super interesting. And I, I know that, um, you wanted to, I don't know if you're going to write your blog post on that, but I definitely didn't know about any of that, which is, it's, it's nice that you're talking about it and you're, you're bringing it up. Um, what would you want people to know? Uh, like people either in STEM, like in the science field or not in the science field or research field about like autism and science and like, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, again, the answer is a lot of things. Um, but in its most, like the most simple answer I can give is that the way that autism is usually portrayed in media is just wrong. Like that's kind of a given. Um, most of us are not like savants that can do seven digit multiplication in our head. Um, but by the same card, like we're just kind of like different people who are also good at things, bad at things, enjoy things, don't enjoy other things. Like it's a, it's a completely, um, like we're, we're just good at different things is I think what it comes down to as far as almost the entire, uh, diagnosis. And for that reason, I think it's good, ac actively good to have people who are both autistic and non-autistic when you're doing any kind of collaborative project, because it just means you have more input, more ideas. Um, and you're more likely to come to a conclusion that works, that is more efficient or effective or whatever you're going for. Do you feel like science for you at least has, um, is more like of a safe space, um, for, cause you said you have autism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or, or do you feel like, is there like a stigma in it? Is that why it's not talked about? Like, why do you think, or it's just like, we've just never brought it up. It's, de it's definitely both. I think, because in one sense, um, there certainly has been a, a stigma. Absolutely. Um, or like, I mean, most people don't look at it as a positive thing, which you don't have to call it positive. I just don't think it's a negative. I think it's like, it's just a difference. You know what I mean? Um, so they're absolutely stigma, but then also, um, historically the way that it's been, um, diagnosed has been really weird. So men are like diagnosed dramatically more than women are with autism, even though it's presumably about occurs at about the same rate. Um, also a lot of people just don't get diagnoses because it's not affordable or it's not accessible or whatever. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons it's not talked about one, it's not generally viewed as positive. Um, and then two, just because most people, a lot of people don't know they are autistic. <laughs> um, I didn't until I was, I think 20, maybe 19. I didn't know. Um, I was diagnosed as a kid and didn't, did not know until like my second year of college. Um, that said, as far as like science being a safe space, maybe, I mean, it's like, I didn't, I don't know if I ever really explicitly perceived myself as being discriminated against for it. Um, but I certainly haven't, uh, perceived myself that way in science. Like it was just, um, if it was a safe space, I think it was mostly just because I was good at science. Um, and so like when in the scientific environment, people like treat you with respect because you're the one that they know can help you with things. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that's a, 
comprehend. I'm going to be thinking about this question for the rest of the afternoon. So I, I appreciate that. No, hey, I mean, if you want to find me later and tell me the rest of your answer, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that, thank you for sharing. That's uh, really important. We should, we should definitely talk about it more. And even if you don't end up doing it for this blog post, I definitely think you should write something about it. I'd like to. Yeah, we well. definitely should. Yeah. Well, Thanks. kind of moving away from this topic, but, or maybe this is your hot take, I don't know. But um, just as a reminder for people that are watching, please feel free to leave a comment for Dawson below. Uh, and then we'll get to it after we answer this final question or maybe more, I don't know how many follow-ups I'll ask. <laughs> but our final or fun bonus question from the preset list is, what is your biggest science hot take? Yep, so this is another one where like, I've been talking about this like just brainstorming for like a week now because there's so many things I want to say. Um, Ethan had an awesome one in his interview, which was that too much of science is about what is good for humans and not just like what's even good for humans indirectly or what's good for the rest of the world, whatever. I thought that was a great one. Um, I'm going to go with something different because as much as I love that one, I just don't want to copy his answer, um, which is that I, I really feel strongly that we should stop naming species after people. Um, there's a very long standing trend in science. Um, so if you don't know, it, every species gets a Latin name that is composed of two words. And a lot of the time people will choose um, either another scientist or like a friend or a family member or student mentor, whatever, and then name a species after them. Um, I think that's kind of a respectable idea to commemorate somebody that means something to you or that has helped um, with the scientific process or even advocated for like the protection of species, species named after politicians for that reason. Um, however, I think there are some, some good reasons that we should not do that. Maybe the most obvious being that a lot of the time we just name them after really bad people. Um, one of the, the ones that kind of came to mind immediately was the first president of Stanford University, David Starr Jordan, who was, um, by all means, a great ichthyologist. He, he was very good at his job. Um, he was also an avid uh, eugenicist who spent a lot of his career advocating for the government to force sterilization on people that he deemed unfit. Um, and there are lots of species named after him because he was a good ichthyologist. Um, one of the most common sculpins, I think, here in California is Jordania zonopi, named after him. Um, there's another species of eel from Florida, which is named after a a scientist, Ernst Hall, who fought for Germany in World War II. Um, it's, a, it's a long list of people who just like, we should not be commemorating these people, I don't think. Um, secondly, the idea that um, when we name a species, like as, as it's belonging to somebody, um, one of our most common birds here in California is the Stellar's jay. Um, we see them all the time. I saw one walking to work this morning. But the idea that, that the Stellar's jay belongs to Stellar is so weird to me. Like, it's just not true. Um, it was a bird that was kind of known about for um, presumably thousands of years before Stellar encountered it. Um, and so I think the idea that when we name these animals after ourselves, we're kind of making them sort of secondary or auxiliary to us, I think is kind of a, a dangerous system for thinking because it affects how we prioritize them. They become um, these things that are, again, peripheral to human existence. They're kind of on the side. Um, and that can affect how we treat them in terms of conservation, in terms of what we do and don't value. Um, and so while I understand and respect the tradition of commemorating people that mean something to you in science or that contribute to science, I don't think that tethering species identities to people that aren't related to that species is a useful tool. Wow, that is a great hot take. <laughs> Thank and you. I, I only laughed when you mentioned the Stanford thing because of the news of the Stanford, yeah, the current Stanford say. president, like stepping yep. down for falsifying data. Um, so I was like, oh, that's funny, because I think I yeah. know you mentioned in the group chat, you're like, great history, <laughs> great people. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is that is awesome. I've never thought of it that way. Um, yeah, no, we should not be naming. And it's also like. It's also like these things existed, like you said, before Stellar, before mm -hmm. us, but we're giving it a name that will be used from here on out. Like, yeah. you know, 
Um, and it's like, but these things maybe don't have a name or maybe like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it very is much human centric of like what we're, we're choosing, but how would you suggest that we name species in that case? Um, yeah, sorry. I think I have to get out of this room in a minute, but um, I think there's just a lot of other good ways to do it. I mean, most commonly we just name species after physical descriptors or we name them after um, where geographically they're from. But also, if you want to respect a person, ask them to name it with you, like ask for their input on how to name it. Um, and don't just slap their name on the animal or the plant or whatever. Well, thank you. I know that you have to leave, so we won't be able to get to any questions. But thank you, everyone, for commenting and for being here. Thank you for joining us, Delson. Um, before we officially end, we want to encourage everyone to follow our social media channels on Instagram and Twitter, which are on the banner on the screen, so that you can join us for the rest of our adventures this summer. And we will post any contact information that Delson shared with us in the chat. Thank you so much for closing out our series. That was an amazing hot take and a great end to the summer. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.